Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization with the mission and vision of furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the CEO of this organization. So today we have a case presentation about using a section tooth as a guide for implant placement. So what is this case all about? So let's start off with a description of our patient. So we have patient X, who is a 48-year-old healthy female who has a congenitally missing mandibular right second premolar, and she has a retained primary right mandibular second molar. And it was restored to the occlusal plane previously, probably around uh, age 20, uh, with an all ceramic crown. So in this photograph, you can see uh, the restored uh, primary uh, second molar uh, in position. Uh, this functioned for the patient for a number of years. Unfortunately, uh, with uh, all restorations, or sh shouldn't say with all restorations, the, with, with some restorations, uh, this, this uh, uh, restoration itself was sound. However, this patient was subject to root resorption of this tooth, and this tooth became mobile. So in this radiograph, you can see here that there is some resorption of the root. Uh, this tooth was not ankylosed, and subsequently the patient was seeking a restorative solution uh, for this tooth, uh, planning in advance for its loss. So we took a panoral radiograph of this patient and basically determined from a radiographic perspective that there was adequate uh, bone height, uh, and in this case the anatomical limiting factor would be sort of where that uh, mandibular uh, that, men that mental foramen, uh, that uh, inferior alveolar nerve, the mandibular nerve, and uh, that mental foramen was. So we don't want to go anywhere near that. So this radiograph here basically demonstrates that we have around 11 and a half millimeters uh, of height of bone to play with. Uh, in previous lectures uh, on the implant course that we'd had, we had basically talked about m giving yourself a, a, a safety zone. So remember that the drill tips that you're going to be using are usually about 0.5 millimeters longer than the actual implant that you're using. And you also want to give yourself at least a two millimeter safety zone. So with 11 and a half millimeters here, if you were to subtract the numbers there, you probably think that about that maybe a 10 millimeter implant would be safe to place in this area. You'll also notice that the root form of the adjacent uh, uh, adult first molar, so the 4-4 and of the 4-6 are adequate such that they're not going to really play a factor in this case. Uh, the, the main concern normally when extracting a tooth and placing an implant is the fact that the void created by the uh, area in which the roots sat usually acts as a bit of an impediment to getting stability of the drill to get it into the right position. So what we're going to propose in this surgical plan, more or less, is to try to use the roots and keep them in place so that they can sort of stabilize the, the drill. And when we're actually drilling through the furcation, we can actually get a better, a better primary stability of that drill and complete our osteotomies uh, once the, this primary channel has been uh, created. So the treatment plan for this patient obviously is consent. Uh, number two, we're, we're going to do is after achieving adequate anesthesia uh, for the patient is to section the primary tooth and then use the section as a guide for implant placement so as to not allow those voids created by earlier extraction of the roots and then trying to create that osteotomy, uh, the challenges that are, that are created with that uh, to try to limit those. And then we're going to place an implant and then we're going to try to place some sort of a graft in the gump, uh, jump or gap junction and then probably give this case around four to six months of healing. So we have a number of photographs and videos to help illustrate that. We'll start off uh, with a video. So in this video, you can see that I'm using a high-speed hand piece with a 702 burr to uh, section, create a section in the furcation uh, area of this patient. Uh, the reason I use a 702 burr is because it's wide enough so that the shank of the drill doesn't get stuck Many times if you try using just the regular 70, uh, sorry, a 701 or 557 or 245 restorative burr, you'll be limited in terms of the depth that you can actually go with the drill by the fact that the component that's actually drilling is a lot narrower than the shank of the drill. The beauty of the 702 burr is the 702 burr, the actual drill component, is wide enough 
that it, when it actually cuts through something, you can actually still uh, engage the shank in that area that you trimmed. So I'm basically grabbing my bag camera here to take a take a photograph of this case. So you'll see these pictures in a second. I'm completing the osti. Oh no, the osteotomy is completed now. I believe what I have here is I have the uh, the uh, the drill. So the uh, the locator, the spade drill, or uh, whatever sort of uh, brand company you have, you can use that to go right through that vacation area and engage the bone. And what this is going to do is basically using those root pieces in position to stabilize uh, stabilize that piece so that you're not sort of kicking around trying to get stability and finding that your osteotomy site is not in the right position. In an ideal world, we can go right into that furcation area and put that implant in the exact position in which the tooth, the tooth was. So I've put the guide pin in place now, and we're going to basically take a radiograph of this to ensure that this guide pin is sort of going in the position in which we want. And you can see uh, in this photograph here now, uh, you can see in the photograph uh, the actual osteotomy that was created using that 702, or I shouldn't say osteotomy, but sectioning the tooth that was created using the uh, 702 burr. You can see how wide that section is right into the frication. And then here's a, a picture. Uh, just We just placed the uh, locator drill or the spade drill uh, into uh, the in, in between the frication, so it's going right into the bone. And now we've put that pin in this photograph in and we take a radiograph in order to ensure that this is going in the position in which we want it to be in. And you can see from this radiograph here that we've gone through the furcation area and we have a beautiful uh, osteotomy. It's parallel to our premolar and it's in the area of bone that we want. And we're, you, though you can't see the mental foramen in here, I can assure you that we're a ways away from the mental foramen. So we'll go to our next video. And in this video now, the goal is to uh, get the tooth out. So now that we've created that osteotomy, we basically want to uh, remove the tooth so that we, we can start using uh, our, uh, our, our progressive series of twist drills to, uh, to uh, create a larger osteotomy and get our implant in place. The, the challenge that we had of having the roots sort of in position in terms of not allowing us to have stability to get that, uh, that twist drill in place the initial twist drill or that pilot twist drill as some people like to call it, uh, that's now been eliminated because we sort of have our sort of highway uh, created for us. Uh, just another word of advice if you're going to be using this, this uh, particular uh, procedure that you probably want to use single patient use drills as it compared to some of the twist drills that we use uh, by sterilizing them, using them on multiple cases. And the main reason is that when you're, whenever you're drilling tooth, and in this case you will end up drilling some tooth material, uh, remember tooth, uh, both enamel and dentin, is a lot more mineralized, so harder uh, than bone. Uh, and uh, so as, as such, you're going to basically find that your, your drills go dull fairly quickly. And so you don't want to be using, if you're going to use a drill on this, it's probably going to uh, dull it up fair, a fair bit. So it'd probably be uh, beneficial to use a, a single patient drill. So you can see here now I'm basically completing my osteotomies by progressively going through the series of twist drills. In this case, we're going to be placing a 3.7 millimeter implant. As I previously described, uh, 10 millimeters is the ideal length for us in this case, giving us enough safety zone for, uh, for uh, both the distance from the drill, making sure that our reference point for that distance we calculated gives us some, gives us some, uh, some space to work with, and also taking into account that 0.5 millimeters that the drill is usually longer than the, than the actual um, uh, implant that we place. So in this picture here, you can sort of see You can see that I'm just completing my osteotomies. And there you go, there's the implant. So I'm just sort of spinning that implant there, demonstrating what slow speed and implant dentistry looks like. So this is on the, the actual motor. We've set the motor at 30 Newton centimeters torque, and this usually spins between 30 to 50 RPM. My assistant is going to place the suction there so the patient's tongue doesn't go and uh, grace the uh, body of the implant. So this video has now been completed, and now what we're going to do is basically show some photographs. And in this first photograph, 
uh, what you can see here is you can actually see the implant in position and you can appreciate the voids uh, to the right and left of this uh, of this implant uh, that were created by the actual roots and the next photograph uh, we basically have a radiograph uh, demonstrating the final implant in place uh, with a cover screw and a healing collar on it and here's a clinical photograph of that cover screw and healing collar on it so what we're going to basically do now in the in the next video is basically demonstrate uh, placement of the bone graft in those little uh, those gap jump junctions and then also placing some sort of a collagen membrane in this case we use a collar plug and suturing that in place so uh, this sorry this is a panograph uh, panoral radiograph or panorex uh, basically demonstrating the implant in place you can see that we are a way distance away from that mental foramen we gave ourselves lots of room and you can see appreciate that cover screw in place and see that the bone levels around this uh, look uh, look lovely I will comment that this was the post-op treatment radiograph uh, you'll see what sort of happened between the placement and this picture in this next video so this video is starting and prior to putting the cover screw on I believe I'm going to grab my bag camera there just to take a picture of this okay. and as you can see I usually have my assistant or one of my staff members sort of put something between the patient's tongue and the implant just so that they're not bringing their tongue up and bringing saliva and all types of other bad things in there cause problems for us. Remember saliva, despite the fact that saliva has uh, immunoglobulins and all types of other things that can sort of help uh, you know, protect, protect us, a part of our immune defense that also has bacteria in there. We don't want to introduce bacteria into a fresh surgical site. So there's the cover screw and healing collar on. And I'm happy with that. And the bone graft's actually already been placed. What I'm doing here is just adapting some of this collagen plug material. In this case, uh, platelet-rich fibrin uh, would have been a, in a, a good material to use. Uh, in this patient, particular patient's case, the patient was a bit uh, aversive to the venipuncture technique and wouldn't consent to that. And as such, we didn't uh, use platelet-rich fibrin. However, platelet-rich fibrin is an excellent uh, material to use in a case like this. Uh, you're probably wondering what's the difference between collar plug and platelet-rich fibrin. Well, platelet-rich fibrin being one of those concentrated growth factor materials, uh, it does it does have a much nicer soft tissue response. Some patients also uh, anecdotally will stay that uh, from their own ex pain experience they find that it's less painful, that the wound heals uh, better. Uh, so personally, I think the soft tissue response and perhaps a little bit less pain perception of the two added benefits. The studies that sort of go along with saying that there's increased bone formation, I don't think the studies have been too promising. At least some of the PhD papers that have been presented in this respect did not corroborate uh, uh, the data points of stating that there is some bone formation. Uh, you can see I'm just giving the patient a little bit more local anesthetic as we were trying to pass these sutures through. The patient had a few, um, had a few owies there, so a little bit more uh, lidocaine for the patient just to uh, facilitate uh, completion of suturing. I just demonstrated there the safety sort of on the the needle. So it's a basic technique uh, to uh, make the needle safe by putting it in towards the needle driver. So we've taken it off the safety and basically one pass at a time. Sometimes I try to do two passes, but you know, the classic in classic suturing, they always tell you nothing wrong with just doing it in one pass. One of my surgical mentors, he basically told me that every time he sutures, he always uses two passes. I've included the full length of the suturing procedure in this video and one of the main reasons was one of the videos I was watching one time uh, the clinician actually 
uh, you know, put the implant in and, you know, everything's all fine and dandy and all that. And basically had, uh, a, a, you know, the, the video go on with showing the suturing procedure after. And it probably went on for about 20 minutes. The implant took five minutes to put in and it took about 20 minutes to put the suture in. And it's just to sort of demonstrate that uh, suturing perhaps is just as important or, you know, every step is important, but equally as important to the actual implant placement procedure. So in this case here, what we're using is a figure eight uh, suture. I like using silk. So this is 3.0 silk uh, on a, uh, I believe it's a three-quarter semicircular uh, needle, uh, reverse cutting. And I'm just putting some knots down here. In this particular video, we'll demonstrate two knot tying techniques. So that was an instrument tie. And now we're just going to put one more interrupted suture in just to help secure that collagen plug just a little bit more and also just give us just a little bit more closure So we finally got that that um, suture through. Now we're just going to demonstrate a hand tie. If you don't know how to hand tie, just go on to uh, go on to YouTube. There probably is a video somewhere demonstrating what hand ties are like. So post-operative checklist. So at the end of the procedure, one has to make sure of the following five things. Ensuring that if there's any transitional prosthesis that has been placed, in this case, there was no transitional prosthesis. Number two, ensuring that post-operative instructions have been provided for the patient in terms of care of the surgical site, oral hygiene, and also any rinses that may be required. Number three, post-operative medications have been provided to the patient in forms of analgesics and antibiotics. Number four, ensuring that post-operative follow-up appointments have been scheduled, for example, for suture removal. And lastly, number five, ensuring that the patient is fit for discharge with a responsible adult escort. I've included some references here. On behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our case presentation.